Good evening. So we're welcoming Jacob Hudgens this evening to kick off our 2024 summer series on prayers of the Bible. Jacob has been a full-time preacher for 20 years. He and his wife, Sarah, have three children. They live in College Station, where he works with the brethren in Twin City Church of Christ in that great college town just south of us. Jacob is joined this evening by his son, Noah, who knows some of our kids here and others who have joined him from the area. We thank you, Jacob, for coming this evening. And with that very brief introduction, we'll turn it over to you. If you would go ahead and grab a Bible and let's turn to Luke chapter 11. We're going to be in a couple of places tonight uh, that are parallel texts. One is Luke 11 and one is Matthew 6. If you want to turn to both of those places, that's fine. I know some of you may be using electronic Bibles and it's easier in some ways to turn, but it's hard to hold your finger in two places when you're pointing at your cell phone. Thank you so much for uh, the invitation to be here tonight. Thank you for being here and uh, opening up the Bible so that we can study about prayer. Uh, I'm excited about this because this is a personal passion of mine, and I especially love to talk about what we're going to talk about tonight, how Jesus teaches us to pray, how he teaches disciples to pray, and how these things can really help us in everyday spiritual living. Uh, And I want to show you that as we look at these texts tonight. We're going to start in Luke 11 and verse 1. Oh, by the way, I, I want to say before I get started, If you have questions, which almost certainly you will, I don't know that I've ever talked about this when I didn't have someone come and tell me that I was wrong about some part of what I said. So you could just, you don't have to wait till the end. You can just raise your hand. Please don't just yell it out because that would be kind of hard. But, you know, just raise your hand and we can talk about that and bring up uh, something that you see in the text or something that you wonder about. Or if you think I'm just dead wrong, you feel free to just tell me. Uh, It's okay. We can still be friends. And we'll just move through it that way. I don't have any particular questions that I'm going to just throw out to the group, but I do want you to feel free that we can conduct this like a class. And uh, so if you have comments or questions about something I say, I'll probably have some times where I stop and just ask for that. So that's my plan for tonight. Luke chapter 11 and verse 1, it says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. So I want to remind you that while Jesus is on earth, he was constantly in this project of training these men who were following him. And all the time he's thinking about how to help them grow into the men that they are going to be, the men who will go preach the gospel, who will change the world by preaching in his name after he has ascended to heaven. And occasionally we see the disciples asking Jesus questions for clarification Sometimes they want to know, what do you mean by that? What's going on with this? And here, as they watch him pray in verse 1, they're so impressed that they ask him to teach them to pray. And they say, let's do that the way John taught his disciples. And we don't have the specifics on John and what he taught his disciples or even much about John having disciples. But it's sort of reminiscent of this statement in Luke chapter 5, where he says, they said to him, this is the disciples, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. It's a criticism here. Notice, what I want you to notice as I put that verse on the board, is everybody has disciples. The Pharisees have disciples, John has disciples, and Jesus has disciples. And they are criticizing Jesus because his disciples aren't doing things the appropriate, accepted type of way, the way John's and the Pharisees' disciples did. So, In that context of prayer, what is prayer going to look like? They say, teach us to pray the way everybody's teaching their disciples something spiritual. Why don't you teach us to pray like you? I want you to notice that there is humility in that request. The humility that says, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't think I'm praying quite right. Do you ever feel that way? Like, I know I'm supposed to pray, and I know it's supposed to go a certain way, and some people seem to get great things out of prayer, but man, I don't. Am I doing something wrong? And they come to Jesus and say, you look like you've got it figured out. I don't. Teach me. Something you're doing, maybe it can rub off on me. There is also priority in this request where they say, this is important. It's important enough for us to stop and talk about. I've watched you, Jesus, and I want that so much that of all the things I could ask you about, I want you to teach me how to pray. And there is also in their request a respect for Jesus' knowledge. 
Jesus knows something I don't know, and I believe that there is something that attracts them to Jesus because of the way he prays. I don't know what that was. I don't think we're told what that was. I don't know if that's Jesus after he prayed, he acted in some way. I don't know if they just watched him and said, wow, something is going on there that's not going on when we pray. I don't know if, like sometimes when we hear someone pray, we say, wow, I've heard something because I've heard something about his relationship with God. I don't know if they heard Jesus pray and say, wow, he's got a relationship with God that I want. But whatever it is, they're humble, they have priorities in the right place, and they respect Jesus' knowledge. Help us improve. So I want to tell you and talk about what Jesus responded when they said, teach us to pray. I want to look at the prayer Jesus says they should be praying. Luke chapter 11 and verse 2. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we ourselves, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation. This is Luke's account. I'm going to put Matthew's account here on the board. If you have it open to Matthew 6, uh, you can see it there. Matthew 6 and verse 9. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I want you to notice that Jesus, in response to this request, gives a prayer and says, pray, either in Luke's account, say these words, or in Matthew's account, pray like this. He is saying, this prayer is the answer to your question. Teach me how I should pray. So there is a vital sense of the right way to pray that is communicated in this prayer. And that's one of the reasons I think it is so important for us to study. It is not an overstatement to tell you that this prayer has changed the world. That this prayer is brilliant and compact and deep and powerful. Especially because this prayer, as Jesus teaches it, gets us straight to the brass tacks with God. The important issues of our life, we are all laid out bare in front of God in just these few words. And so I want to spend some time exploring the prayer, and I want to just kind of give you a few ideas of how I think of this prayer and sort of talk about the content of the prayer. First, I want to say that Jesus' prayer is short yet deep. I hope you notice how short the prayer is. I don't know if you are looking at a Bible on a page like this. For me, it's about this big. Isn't that amazing? It's so short. It probably takes us less than a minute to say. It's a bit surprising, in fact, to me, because Jesus is a man who was known for staying up all night in prayer to God, which he does on several occasions. Now think about that. If you met someone and you know that they stay up all night praying to God, and you say, hey, teach me how to pray like you, and they give you a prayer that's this long, aren't you a little confused? Because it doesn't seem like it fits. And so Jesus is teaching us something with the brevity of this prayer. I want you to think about what he might be teaching us by giving us something so short. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 6. If you have your marker or your finger, however you're keeping track of that, we will be back in Luke 11 in a minute. But let's look at Matthew 6 for a moment. Jesus has some thoughts about the length of prayers throughout the Gospels. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 7, He says, when you pray, Matthew 6, 7, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, and then he goes on to give the prayer that we're studying. So he says, instead of many words, say these few words. Instead of talking as if you can nag God into getting his attention, and you can beat him down with vain repetitions, just say what you need. Just pray like this. So I want you to see, in Jesus' mind, long prayers are associated with what he calls vain repetitions, or yours might say something like empty phrases. We're not going to wear God out by praying so long that he says, fine, fine, just be quiet. I'll give you whatever. Just had enough of you talking. This is not the way prayer works. 
Jesus also says in Mark chapter 12 and verse 38, in his teaching, he said, beware of the scribes who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. In Jesus' mind, pre- long prayers are associated with pretense. Now, you might be wondering, I mean, we've already talked about this. Jesus stayed up all night praying, right? So how did he do that without having long prayers that, like the ones he's describing here? Well, I want to just suggest something based on the wording here. This is Matthew 26, 44, where Jesus is praying in the garden. And it says, so leaving them, that's Peter and James and John, leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. See, Jesus doesn't mind repeating his prayers, even if they're short, which this prayer is short, what's recorded of it. Let this cup pass from me is the essence of the prayer. And he repeats the same words over and over again. It could be that when Jesus has an all-nighter in prayer to God, he's just saying the same things over and over and over again. And if that sounds maybe monotonous to you or maybe mindless, let me just remind you that we probably all had times in our lives where we had something that was so important to us, so pressing. Maybe we were just in such a desperate position that you can pray and you can try to think about other things, but that's the thing that keeps coming up. That's the thing that dominates your thinking. And so Jesus, in those moments, he just prays about that thing, and he prays about it over and over and over again. And so he's not praying long prayers and just wearing everyone out and wearing God out, but instead he is praying prayers, perhaps with this specificity, and saying the same thing over and over again. So please don't hear me to say, as I talk about this tonight, that long prayers are bad, and anybody who says a long prayer is not doing it right. I don't believe that's what Jesus is saying. I am introducing an idea here from Jesus that I believe might help us. I think it is extraordinarily helpful to know that prayers still count even when they're short. That it's not as if you just saying a few things to God is somehow not qualifying as prayer. Like, I haven't done it right if I don't spend 30 minutes or an hour or hours and hours in prayer each day. Jesus is saying, no, pray like this. Pray what's on your heart. Or in this case, pray the things that are important to both you and to God. But the other part of this, I said Jesus' prayer is short, yet it's deep. I think sometimes we confuse brevity with shallowness. And that just because it's a short prayer, we think, well, there's not much to it. Jesus' prayer touches on my status before God, God's work and God's reign, my needs, my weakness, my sin, how I treat other people, and my outlook for the day ahead. Those are the heaviest issues we could possibly consider. And he does it all in this much text. That's what I want you to see. Don't think that there's nothing to it just because it's short. I was teaching uh, the high school class at Twin City where we worship, and uh, we were discussing Christian friendships, and I asked the kids, raise your hand if you have shallow friendships. And of course, everybody raised their hand. Everybody's got some people in their lives that they have shallow relationships with, right? We all have them. And then I said, raise your hand if you like that. And of course, nobody, nobody likes that. Doesn't it frustrate you a little bit to have people in your life that you know really well, but you don't know really well? To have people in your life that no matter how long you know them and how much you talk to them, the relationship just stays at that high level. You never know the real person and they never know the real you. And yet, aren't there people in your life that if you see them, even if you haven't talked to them in months or even years, you're going to give them a big hug and you're going to say, how are you doing? And you know that when they say how they're doing, they're not just going to tell you fine. They're going to tell you about their heart. And in that moment, you will immediately move to depth because that's the nature of your relationship. You have people like that. I do too. Now, what about God? Jesus is saying God is one who knows you so well and you know so well that when you start talking to him, you can immediately move to depth. You don't have to have the small talk. You don't have to say, oh God, I hope this and I hope this and I hope you're doing all right and everything's good. Just, just cut to the chase. And that's what this prayer is. It's short, but it's deep. 
In just a few words, you reaffirm who you are and the bond you have with God in just these words. It is short, but it is deep. All right, so I'm going to take a second and take a breath. Thoughts, questions, disputes, comments, anything? Yep. Mm -hmm. You use the word uh, vain repetitions, but then in the other passage you read, he was repetitive. Yes. Right. So, so vain, vain speaks to, do I mean it? You know, is there a purpose to it? Because it's something that's articulating something I feel. And I think when he says there are vain or mindless or empty phrases, I think he's saying more, there are things you're saying because they're the churchy way to, we would say, the churchy way to talk about it. You know, it doesn't mean anything to me, but I'm supposed to say this. And especially in the vain repetition, I say it over and over again. So maybe it loses its sense. Uh, whereas, I don't think there's any question Jesus means, let this cup pass from me. So yeah, it's not the repetition that's the issue uh, as much as the vanity. That's, that's what I think. Yeah. I think in this instance that we're talking about, it showed Jesus' humanity. He was about to suffer tremendously. And when we've been in situations like that, that's about all we can utter. Right. It, it dominates the thinking, and that comes out in prayer, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Other thoughts? Yes. What do you think about the, uh, the repeated use of plural pronouns? And it just seems like it's something that he's teaching them to do together. Yes. Uh, so we think, at least when I think about praying, I think about I'm praying. But he's really teaching them to pray together. Yes, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. Um, it does introduce the very interesting possibility that they are praying as a community. And especially... Uh, there is power in saying words like this together, and I don't mean uh, chanting the same words or something like that, but where we are sharing and we are praying with one another about aligned priorities, like your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, um, where it's, yes, that's my thought, but if we are praying that together as brothers, there's a power there. I, think, I do think it's intended for that with the plurals, yes. Other thoughts? Yes? I think it's a fair point to make that Brevity does not mean that it's shallow, because when you think of some of the most iconic passages across Scripture, or even things that we would say, I love you, that is three words. But in its context can mean everything, right? right? Do you think of Jesus wept? The, just the, the sheer impact that that verse makes means everything. I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. It takes a moment to say, but how much that means to us. So it very much shows brevity is not the same thing as pretense. It is not the same thing as not taking it seriously or irreverence. Right. Proverbs are a great example of that. They're pretty much the shortest and best way to say something. And I, they have more power because of that. I, I think the struggle here is when we're talking to God to embrace that idea that while we may communicate better by talking around something over and over again, there is also just as much, if I mean a few words, that's, that's what I, prayer is supposed to be. So that it doesn't mean that there's less going on just because it's a little shorter. All right, um, let's move on. The second thing I want to talk about is that Jesus' prayer is familiar, yet it's respectful. So we're here in Matthew 6. Let's just look at the prayer as it, as it is here. In Matthew 6 and verse 9, he says, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. All right, so first... It's extremely notable that Jesus talks about God as his Father, but that's not just, you know, we might think when we hear that for the first time that that's because Jesus is God's Son. And so he says, Father. And yes, of course, Jesus is going to call God his Father. But he says, no, you pray calling on God as your Father, our Father in heaven. So there is a familiarity to that, and I want you to see that. He wants his disciples, which you and I are his disciples, he wants his disciples to think of God as their father and to address him as father. And that has tremendous emotional baggage for us because father is a human relationship that we all have. For some of us, that's a great relationship, has a lot of good emotions. For some of us, that's a negative relationship that has a lot of negative emotions. But one way or another, it's not really an idea that we're neutral about. It means something. And here is God as the true, perfect Father who is now calling on us, you come talk to me as your Father. Familiar. And I want you to hear the familiar tone of that. 
But then immediately in verse 9, he also says, hallowed be your name. Hallowed. So that means that we don't just view God as, you know, the indulgent dad who ruffles your hair. We don't just view him as casual and familiar. We also view him as an awesome and fearsome king who rules and who holds our fate in his hand. And that's not something to take lightly. So hallowed is a word that means to be respected or honored. In fact, uh, these three phrases, if you look in verse 9, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Some have pointed out that there is a similarity in those three phrases. Uh, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. The way those are worded, where on earth as it is in heaven may modify all three phrases. Your name be holy or revered on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That idea that everything we want is reflecting the perfect obedience of God in heaven. So, verse 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come is a way of describing God's work in the Messiah, in the world, that God had promised to bring his Messiah into the world and through him to establish his rule and to bring more people into relationship with him, people who are not just Jews but also Gentiles because his reign is established, his kingdom has come. And so when he teaches us to pray, he says pray for God's work. God's working in the world and he has brought his son into the world to establish that work, and then that work, of course, is going to continue when Jesus is no longer present on earth. But his disciples pray for that work. Your kingdom come, your will be done. So this phrase in verse 10, on earth as it is in heaven, requires a little comment because I'm not sure we always process what's going on with that phrase. Uh, The idea is that in heaven, the angelic beings constantly and solely obey God. God's will is done in heaven. So that when God says something, it's as good as done in the moment. Because of course, his creatures who serve him in heaven are going to obey him completely. They're going to revere him. They're going to do his will. And so the prayer is, I want that same style of selfless, complete obedience to reign here, the way it reigns in heaven. I want heaven to become, I want earth to become more like heaven in that we're going to obey God where we are. And so I just want to suggest that when you pray words like those, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that you are signing yourself up to do God's will. This is not a prayer where you say, God, somehow make earth more like heaven, but I'm going to do my own thing. It is instead, I'm going to do your will. I'm going to do your will in my personal life. I'm going to do your will in my home. I'm going to do your will in the local church of which I'm a part, in the community where I live. I'm going to do your will in every arena in which I exist. And when I pray that, I'm saying, yes, I'm on board for that, and I want what's happening in me to happen throughout the whole world, that earth will reflect heaven. That's my prayer. It is a big prayer. Jesus says, this is what I want you to pray. This is how I pray. Teach us to pray, Jesus. I want you to see that all of these phrases, including the one that some prayers have at the end, some versions have at the end, yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, all of these phrases reflect tremendous respect for God, that we come to God as supplicant and he is the ruler that we remember how we stand before God as we approach him. So I just want you to think about familiar and respectful, like two poles of prayer. Familiar and respectful. And I would suggest that we tend to move toward one pole or the other. So just, and probably you know which pole you tend toward. There are some people who are familiar in the way they talk about and talk to God to the point that perhaps they sound irreverent to some. And then there are some people who are so filled with respect for God that their language is full of these and thous. They will not say things like I in in their prayers because that seems like 
Uh, it's a disrespectful way to talk to God. We are approaching God, and so our words need to reflect that. And you see, we have both of those. And I want you to see that neither one of these are solely acceptable, that we need to be familiar enough with God that we can see him and address him as Father, and we need to be respectful enough to God that we acknowledge his great power and his status and how we fit beneath him. We need both of those. And so I want you to see how in this short prayer, Jesus couches both of those together. He says, don't pray to God with a wrong tone. Don't think you're so familiar that he's going to do everything you say and that you're in charge of him. But don't think you can be so respectful that you forget that he loves you and that he cares for you like a father. Thoughts on that? We'll talk about that in a minute. Yes, the kingdom come question. Uh, I, have a, I have a little part in a few uh, minutes here that we'll, we'll kind of talk about that. I'll share my thoughts, and then I'm sure um, I'll get a lot of other thoughts that come out. So, Different thoughts than mine. All right, other, other uh, comments, questions here? All right, we'll keep trucking. So Jesus' prayer is daily, and yet it is fresh. Verse 11, Matthew 6 and verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. What is daily bread a reference to? Where have we read daily bread in the Bible? Proverbs 38. Okay, what is that? Not too much, not too little, right. Right. Give me enough. Well, where is, the, where is the time where God provides daily bread? Yeah, man, man in the wilderness, right? Um, what made it daily bread? Okay. It only lasted a day. It came every day, yes, but you don't get a bunch of it and stuff it in your cupboard, right? That would be a problem, okay? Because God made it so that it would not work to try to have more than enough for the day. I want you to think about daily bread. Jesus says, give us this day our daily bread, that we are, first of all, acknowledging that God's the source of our sustenance. We're dependent on him. We don't go get our daily bread. It's something God gives, and we pray and ask for it. But daily bread changes our perspective about what we have. Daily bread Think about the, the Israelites. Daily bread means you know you always have enough for today, but you never have enough for tomorrow. Think about it. And think about how our brains work. Think about how I mean, you and I, we're in a much different position than the Israelites in the wilderness, and in fact, than most of Jesus' audience, uh, because we don't usually live day by day. We plan ahead. And we have food uh, so that, you know, when major storms come through, we know we're going to have enough to survive for a while if we have to. And we have refrigerators full of food and, and kitchen cabinets full of food. We have what we need, and we have far more. And so it's a little challenging to think about praying for thanks for daily bread. But I think there is something powerful here. I want you to think about what it's like to live life daily, live life day by day. Daily bread changes your perspective. I don't have enough for tomorrow, but tomorrow, God will be there. And God will give me what I need for tomorrow, tomorrow. But today, he's going to give me what I need for today. Give me this day my daily bread. I want you to look down in verse 34 of Matthew 6. Matthew 6 and verse 34. It says, therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I love that last phrase because I always think Jesus may be kind of smiling when he says that. Don't borrow trouble from tomorrow. Okay, there will be plenty of trouble tomorrow. If you're worried about tomorrow today, you're going to make today more stressful, and you're still going to have to deal with it tomorrow. Instead, just take it a day at a time. Give us this day our daily bread. 
Pray every day for the things you need and don't get too far ahead of the moment. It is a daily prayer. In fact, I wonder if Jesus were to look at our pantries and refrigerators, if he wouldn't just say what he said several times while he was here on earth, which is, moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. These are not things to be counted on. It is God who gives us what we need and God who says, I will provide daily. Now, I want you to think about if Jesus teaches us to pray and he teaches this prayer, it's intended to be prayed daily because each day we're going to need our daily bread. So he is intending us to adopt a new perspective about our lives that each day we're appealing to God and trusting him for the day's necessities. But the concern is that a prayer like that would get stale. I mean, you repeat it every day. So we talked about vain repetitions, right? Doesn't that sound like it'll be a vain repetition before long? So how does Jesus make a prayer that will be fresh? Let's go back to Luke chapter 11. How do we pray something so many times in a row, so many days in a row, and stay emotionally engaged in the prayer? And I want to show you how Jesus wants us to do that. Luke chapter 11, after he says the prayer in verses 2 to 4, this is what he tells the story of in verse 5. Luke 11 and verse 5, he said to them, which of you has a friend, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed, I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and through the one who knocks it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So it's a story about continually offering our requests, being persistent. He talks about a man whose relationship, you know, he has a friend who can give him what he needs, but the relationship alone doesn't give him what he needs. It is only his persistence. I'm not going anywhere. Finally, the man is so annoyed that he does what he needs. And he says, how much more will God respond to your continual requests? Ask, seek, knock. How much more does God want to give good gifts to his children? So what I want you to see is that that makes the prayer forever fresh. Every day, we approach God with our needs, our persistent daily needs, our relational needs, our emotional needs, our weakness, our pain, and we ask him for things in confidence. And that prayer, brothers and sisters, is never stale. If you really empty your bucket out to God in prayer, you're not going to get bored. It's not something that will grow tiresome where you say, oh, I'm supposed to pray today. Instead, it will be something where you are approaching a good giving God and you say, here's what's on my heart. Here's what I'm desperate for today. And I trust that you'll give me what I need today. So yes, Jesus does expect us to pray daily, but Jesus also wants us to pray in this way where that prayer is never the same, never stale, always fresh. All right, thoughts on that? Am I beating you guys into submission? Okay. Oh, yes, ma'am. I was thinking Matthew 6, 8, he says the Father knows what we need before we ask him. Yes. And yet, he still wants us to ask him. Right. He already knows. So this is not a, I got to let God know because he might have forgotten or not overlooked me. Uh, but it is, he wants this. He wants me to ask and ask him continually because he's a father who's itching to bless his children. That's, that's his desire. Other thoughts? All right. Fourth thing I want you to see is that Jesus' prayer is bold, yet it's humble. So we're talking about requests, and speaking of requests, I want to look at these last two requests. In Luke 11 and verse 4, we're just jumping over to Luke's account here. Luke 11 and verse 4, he says, Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. So, there are three requests in the prayer, give, forgive, and don't lead. And so here, 
I want to focus on those last two. Forgive us our sins, for we forgive our debtors. It uses the language of debt. It's probably not talking about financial debts, although it could be. Probably talking about how people do wrong against us, and they owe us something in the same way that we have done wrong and owe God. Now, I want you to see how this, the way Jesus phrases this, forces us to be humble. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. First of all, it acknowledges that I have sins. I have not done right, and I need help and forgiveness. I cannot earn my way back into God's good graces. It is something he must give, he must forgive. But then there is also the fact that other people have done similar things to what I have done, and I have a requirement, an expectation that I will let those things go. So, can I ask, is there a place in your prayers for confessing sin? Is there a place in your prayers for forgiving other people who have hurt you, who have sinned against you? If this prayer is daily, and as I said, I think it is, then what Jesus is expecting is that his disciples have a daily time where they examine their hearts. How do I stand before my God? What have I done that might have brought shame on God or breached our relationship? What have I done that I need to confess and ask forgiveness for? And I do believe that this can be much more specific than a generic, you know, forgive us our sins that there should be a daily time where I also ask, am I holding something against someone else? There's bitterness in my heart about what's happened to me. And one of the things that's so important about doing that daily is that we never let things get so bitter and hard and full of hatred in our own hearts that we can't easily come out of that. Jesus wants this to be a consistent part of the way we pray. He also says in verse 4, lead us not into temptation. The word temptation means testing. And so it means that in the course of the day ahead, and I always picture this as looking at the day ahead. You may disagree with me about that. That's fine. But I always picture it as looking at, okay, I'm about to have a day. And I don't know everything that this day is going to unfold in front of me, but I know there's a possibility that I'll be tested. Maybe I'll be solicited to do something sinful. Or maybe I'll be tested by some hardship, some weakness in myself exposed, some struggle, some personal relationship that puts a a burden on me. And Jesus says, and he says this over and over again, pray to God that you not enter into testing. And I again believe that that's a prayer intended to be offered daily. Jesus says this a lot. This is Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He says this a lot. Ask, ask, ask for God to direct you away from testing. This is an interesting prayer because you would never know if it got answered. How many times do we pray, lead me not into temptation, and God answers that prayer? We don't know because those are just the times where we don't know what we avoided. And yet here Jesus says this is important. So what I want you to see here is that we have the boldness to ask. We ask for forgiveness. We ask for his leading. We ask for him to give us our daily bread. There is boldness there that of all the people in the world, I am so unworthy to approach God and ask for anything. And yet he says, come ask. And yet on the other hand, there is the humility to say, The spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. Please don't let me be tested. The humility to say I have sinned and struggled and that I have work to do in forgiving other people. The humility to say, yes, I need your help because I am not all that I should be. And this is prayer. So what I want to do, um, I've got a few minutes left here. Uh, I mentioned earlier I have a couple of questions that are sort of the typical questions uh, that come up when we talk about these texts. And I want to answer a couple of them. Uh, then I'll open it up for a minute, and then uh, I've got some takeaways at the end. Okay, the first question is, uh, are we intended to pray this prayer all the time? Uh, Let me just say, you know, the way we've talked about it, and really the way the Gospels set this up, you would think that it was intended to be prayed all the time, but New Testament Christians did not pray this prayer all the time. 
We see a lot of their prayers recorded for us, but we never see this prayer. It is only here in Jesus' words. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they didn't pray it. It could have just been understood, but it does mean that it's not exclusive because there are other prayers offered, and that doesn't seem to be a difficulty. Now, I'll just tell you this is my opinion, so you're free to disagree with it, but my opinion is that this prayer is a kind of standard daily prayer for disciples. This is what disciples pray regularly to connect with God. That not every prayer has to have some kind of formal need that prompts it. I'm in trouble, I better pray. But instead, I'm going to have regular prayer, just a part of my life with God. And this seems like a prayer that Jesus says, here's a way you can connect with God about the important issues in a short period of time. And just kind of have as a daily, ongoing conversation with God. Uh, The second question is one that was asked a minute ago. uh, Can we pray your kingdom come, or how should that go? Uh, So Luke 11, 2 Uh, your kingdom come. Uh, In Matthew's account, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven seems to modify your kingdom come. Uh, So the kingdom is the idea of God's reign. I mentioned that earlier, uh, which is not a physical kingdom. Uh, It is a spiritual kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world, Jesus says. And it's important for us to acknowledge that Jesus established his kingdom. I think that's really important for us to know and that we, whatever we're going to say about how we pray, uh, we need to acknowledge that fact biblically. Jesus talked about this a lot. New Testament writers clearly describe themselves as being part of the kingdom, transferred into the kingdom. Uh, That is all uh, simple enough in my judgment. So while that's true, there is a sense in which this gets a little complicated because the other thing to say is that the kingdom is not yet complete. And so there are a number of places where we're told we still await an entrance into the kingdom, like in 2 Peter 1. Or we're told that we're going to inherit the kingdom or enter the kingdom. Jesus uses those phrases in his parables when he's pointing at final judgment stuff, like in Matthew 25, where he comes back and gives judgment, inherit the kingdom or enter the kingdom. Well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, so, So you have this kind of in-between space that we live in, right? We live in the space where the kingdom has been established, but the kingdom's not complete, where we await the final stages of what God's going to do when Jesus returns. So what does that all mean for your kingdom come? I think if we don't acknowledge that Jesus has established his kingdom, this prayer feels very different. It feels like we're not understanding that there was a part of what Jesus came to do that has been accomplished, and that's important to acknowledge. But I do, uh, I do think that this phrase, and this is, this is, again, my opinion, and I'm sure you guys may disagree with me, and that's fine. Uh, this is my opinion about your kingdom come. I do believe that I can pray this phrase if what I mean is one of these two things. I can pray this phrase if, one, I pray for God to further his plan and the work which Jesus began, that will continue until the kingdom is consummated. So to me, it's a lot like New Testament Christians praying, come Lord Jesus. That we're saying where we are in God's work, we want the next step. We want Jesus to return. We want good things to continue to happen. We want God's plan to continue. And I think that's part of what Jesus is meaning. He says, your kingdom come. We see what you're doing and we want it to keep going. The other way I would say I can pray this is if I pray for God to expand his kingdom into the hearts of more and more people who are submitting themselves to the reign of Jesus. I'm talking here about evangelism uh, because I do want that, and I believe God wants that, for more and more people to become a part of his kingdom. And so your kingdom come in the sense that we continue to follow you and submit to you and that more and more people do. So the, the question was asked about public prayer, and I think... Uh, that's a challenging thing because people, you don't always know what people are going to take from a phrase like this. Um, so, you know, I think there has to be an understanding that we have where what we mean by something and maybe even some explanatory things if we're praying publicly. But I do think uh, the phrase itself, I wouldn't say, is somehow um, banned as long as we understand some of the biblical truth that su- should support it. So that's my opinion about that. And I've done it so that We have two minutes, and I don't think any of you have time to respond. That was not intentional, (laughs) but I do have, like, five more points, so. All right. Why don't don't I go through my points, and then if we've got more, y'all can can have it. Okay, so 
because I, I don't want to leave this prayer and just think about the controversy part. Um, I don't think that this prayer was intended just to be focused on in that part. So uh, I want to give you five uh, things that we can learn here. Uh, and I want you to take these things through the prayers you're going to study through this summer and let them kind of guide your praying. Uh, first is lower yourself in prayer. Prayer is a time, Jesus shows this, to remind ourselves of where we fit in the universe. We remember which direction up is when we pray. Have you noticed that sometimes we get to be thinking, we get to thinking that we are the center of the universe when we're not praying a lot? Maybe we're not opening our Bibles a lot. Everything revolves around me. Prayer is where we remember God's in heaven and we're on earth. Uh, talk to God about the real stuff. Talk to God about the real stuff. That's what Jesus is trying to do. Tell us this is the important stuff. Please, don't just say churchy things to God that don't mean anything to you. I think that files under vain repetitions that we've already discussed. Please don't let prayer go by without really sharing your heart with God. Build a daily prayer habit. I do believe Jesus wants us to pray daily. Give us this day our daily bread. Uh, remember, it doesn't have to be super long, super involved, but this is something that we need as a connection with God. This is the primary way we talk to God, just as his word is the primary way he speaks to us. Recalibrate yourself. Again, we grow self-absorbed and we struggle with perspective, but when you look at what God is saying and what God has done, when you talk to him, uh, it changes you. It fixes those selfish problems. And then emerge from prayer ready to act. Talk about your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're going to leave our prayers ready to go do something. In fact, you might think of things as you're praying. This is something I need to do, someone I need to check on, some good that I need to do. This is a time where I say, okay, I've connected with God. Now what am I going to do? How do I serve him today? And so be ready to act as we move forward. Jesus often emerges from prayer ready to go do something, ready to go preach to the next towns, ready to face the crowds that are going to arrest him, ready to move on. So Jesus... They, say, and they ask him, teach us to pray, and these are some of the things that I think he wants us to know. So um, I apologize for taking all the time, but I appreciate you guys listening so well uh, and thankful for this opportunity to kind of think about and kick off this uh, set of studies on prayer. I believe we're going to ask uh, Brother Jess to lead us in a word of prayer to close us out.